Psalm 139. Again, we're partnering with 13 churches across our movement, the Church of God, and we are on this journey together. Uh, We are going to take a look at uh, three different things. Uh, First is relatable. This is where we'll be at in September and how we understand God so that we can understand ourselves so that then we can relate to other people. The world can't relate to others Because they don't have a proper understanding of God. And without a proper understanding of God, you will never have a proper understanding of yourself. And so that's why we have a world that is at war against itself. Because we have to know who God is so we can know who we are, so we can relate to other people. And Jesus demonstrated, I'm getting ahead in in the message, we'll get to that in a minute. The second uh, month, in, um, in the month of October, we're going to look at canyons. Uh, we have canyons in our life uh, that uh, the enemy attempts to use as pitfalls to stop us in our relationship with Christ. And in, in the month of November, we're going to look at God's grace and going through the book of Galatians. And so I'm very, very excited about this journey. But when we started putting this together, I was not excited about September, and I decided that we as a church were going to do something else in September, and then we would pick up with the journal in uh, October and November. But then I guess you could say God convicted me, God spoke to me and said, nope, we, you better get back on board this. One of the things that we will look at, and I want to encourage you to do this, uh, in September, we're going to talk a little bit about the Enneagram. And you say, the Ennea what? Uh, it is the Enneagram. And if you've not heard of the, I'd not heard of the Enneagram. Uh, but when I looked at the Enneagram, I thought, all that does is give us an excuse for the way that we are. And that's not the case at all. The Enneagram allows us to see the traits that we have that are wired deep inside of us and allows us to move past those in growing in our relationship with God. This afternoon, we will share on our Facebook page an Enneagram test, and tomorrow, uh, our church office will send out an Enneagram test. There will be two. There's one that's a free, a free one, and then there's one, if you choose to go a little bit deeper in this, uh, you can pay, I think it's $12 for one that's deeper. You can go and get some more that are $120, 200 and you can go get as deep a test as you want of these. You can say, now what does that have to do with the Scripture? It doesn't have a lot to do with the scripture, but it has a lot to do with understanding who we are. So when we understand who God is, then we can have a proper understanding of ourselves, so that we can say, oh yeah, this is how I am wired in certain areas, and I need to bring that into an alignment with what God has said about me. The most important thing in your life is that you understand God so that you can have a proper understanding of yourself so that you can then relate to other people. Have you ever heard people say, oh, well, that's just how so-and-so is? You probably have an uncle in your family that you say, oh, that's just how uncle so-and-so is. And we go through life making excuses for ourselves and other people saying, well, that's just how they are. That's just how they're wired. And life itself becomes an excuse instead of understanding, well, I might have a predisposition for this, but I can't go towards that sin. I have to understand how the power of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross defeated that sin so that I can get over that and become more like Christ. You see, what we've done in our society, in our culture in America, is that we have become a culture of making excuses instead of becoming more and more like Christ. And so in the church, we've adopted this culture in a lot of different areas, and we've made excuses for how we are, instead of saying, no, 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 no. That's not how God intended for us to be. That's not how God intended for me to be. I have to get over myself, and I have to become more and more like Christ. Maybe you have often wondered, why is it that I'm here? 
you may have even wondered, why is it that God created me? You may go a few steps further into that, and you may say, why am I where I'm at? And then you may have gone a few steps further, and you say, well, why do I have the faults? Why do I do the sins that I have? And Paul wrote a lot about that in the book of Romans, and we're going to take a look at some of that over the next few weeks. Why is it that I am the way that I am? All throughout the Scripture, all throughout the Scripture, absolutely everywhere in the Scripture, God is giving us His, uh, his um, uh, a thumbprint on our lives. And what we have to do is dive into the Scripture so that we can see who it is that God intends for us to be. Now, what the world wants to tell you is that you are just a product of your parents. I don't believe that. I don't believe that you are a product of your parents, meaning that it was your parents' choice at some point for you to be a part of this earth. I don't believe that. I believe that you are here because the God who spoke the world into existence chose for you to be here. It's not an accident that you are here. You're not a product of your parents. You are a product of God Almighty and nobody else. That's something that I struggled with um, for a few years of my life. I wasn't a planned birth, and I was the reason that my parents decided to get married. Because at that point, whenever you got pregnant before you were married, you had to get married. There was no choice. That's what you had to do. And that produced a disastrous marriage. And so if you are the reason that your parents get married because that's what you're supposed to do, because mom got pregnant before they were married, then you see a lot of the enemy says to you, a lot of the reason of the bad that came out of that, well, that's your fault. But I had to have a proper understanding that God is the reason that I'm in the world. My parents were a vessel that God chose to place me here. And for each and every one of you, Planned or not by human beings, hear me when I say this, you were planned by God. God wants you here. God chose you here. And until you understand that, your world will continue to spin out of control. But here's the foundation of that. You have to understand God before you understand yourself. If you don't understand God or have a simple understanding of that, and be pursuing that, you'll never understand yourself. You don't understand God, you'll not understand yourself. And if you don't understand yourself, you'll never be able to relate to other people on the world. It all goes back to understanding who God is. I want you to, if you write things down, I, I try to give you something periodically to, to write down. David knew, as we must know, that wrong ideas about God will inevitably lead to wrong ideas about who we are. Happens every single time. Happens every single time. When we have a wrong understanding of God, we'll have a wrong understanding of who we are. When we have a wrong understanding of God, or we think wrong things about God, then it causes us to live not the way that God intended us to live, but instead, it causes us to get further and further and further away from God. And so here's what that might look like. Some of us view God as a dictator, where when we step out of line just a little bit, God's going to punish us and God's going to crush us. There are consequences to sin that God has told us about. But God does not seek great joy whenever we sin in punishing us. And so whenever we have a wrong view of God that God is a dictator who loves to punish us, then that's how we live our life. And we start living our life in fear. And we, dis we get so immobilized in fear that we are paralyzed and can't even go forward in our relationship with him. Another view that is a wrong view of God, that God is just like this great big grandpa, that we can crawl up on grandpa or our dad's lap, and we can say, God, God, this is what I need. And God is just going to lavish all of these gifts about, gift, gifts over and over and over and over and over of us. 
You see, when you have that wrong view of God, then you're going to live your life however you want to live. And then when a crisis comes up, you're going to go crawl up in the lap and just lay there and say, Oh, God, I need your help. Please help get me out of this mess. And we see people that are Christians today who have that view of God, and they live their life however they want to live, and then they think, oh, I'll just go crawl up into God's lap, and then whenever I need help, God's going to get me out of trouble. And then whenever God doesn't just automatically zap them up out of trouble, like, beam me up, Scotty, I'm getting out of trouble, then they think, oh, I've got all this, and this. so it's a cycle over and over and over and over that we have to stop and say, we need to have a right view of God so that I can understand who I am, who he made me to be, so I can relate to other people. You've got to have a right view of God so that it doesn't lead to a wrong idea about who he created you to be. So take a look with me at the 139th Psalm. And as we read this Psalm, we're going to skip a little bit of the middle section, but as we read this Psalm, I pray that you pray and ask God, what is it, God, that you want to teach me from this psalm about who you are and who I am? And when you understand who you are, you'll understand who you belong to. So, 139 Psalm, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. That one verse is an absolute amazing verse. You search me and you know me. You see, before you understand yourself, you have to know that God knows you. God knows you. Verse 2. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Skip down to verse 13. And listen to what David is proclaiming here over the Lord. or That the Lord is proclaiming over David. That then is passed on to us. That David is proclaiming the goodness of God. Verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You see, that right there alone tells you. You're not a product of your parents. Your parents were vessels that God used to knit you together. Your parents didn't make you. It was God that was doing the knitting inside your mother's womb. Verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of you, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. And then the last part of this, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my hearts. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. I want to tell you how wonderful you are. And, and, and I hope that you hear that from the Spirit that I'm speaking that over you. You are wonderful. And I wish that we had time this morning to go around this room and for me to place my hands upon each and every one of you and look you eyeball to eyeball and say to you, You are wonderful. What we find in the 139th Psalm is the word of the Lord that David is proclaiming. The truth of who God is and the truth of who we are that we have to understand that you are absolutely wonderful. Now the enemy is going to tell you you're not wonderful. The enemy is going to tell you that there's nothing wonderful about you. But here's the deal. You are wonderful not because of who you are. You are wonderful, not because of anything that you may have done or you may not have done. You are wonderful because God says that you are wonderful. And he absolutely intended for you to be here because he created you. See what David wrote in the 139th Psalm? 
He said, God created you, and you are wonderfully made. Now, here's what we have to understand. Here's what we have to get, and we have to adopt this and apply it to our life all the time. It doesn't matter what deficiencies or things that you might lack in your life, and the world might put a label on you and say, well, this is you. None of that matters to God because He wonderfully created you. And you are the product of the God that spoke, things, that spoke this world into existence. I wish that we could see the work that God has done for each and every one of you. To see the wonderful that He brought onto the earth through you. And to see the wonderfulness of what He wants to do in your life. And I wish that we could take the glasses, if you will, that God looks at us through, that sees His wonderful creation. You are wonderful. That's what David is writing to remind us of. That you, in verse 14, he says, are fearfully and wonderfully made, not because of you, not because of any of your achievements, not because of anything that you have done. You are wonderful because the creator of the universe declares your wonderfulness. Your life, David says, is precious to God. And he said, you knew the number of my days. You knew all of that. It was all written and it was all planned before I ever was knit together in my mother's womb. He says in verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed, my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. Listen, you were created and designed with a purpose. And we have to figure out who God is so that we can figure out who we are so that we are able to relate to the world and proclaim the wonderfulness of God over each one that he has created as well. You've got to discover that. And the way that you discover that is by having a right, true, proper understanding of God so that you are able to know who you are. Take a look at verse 14. If you highlight in your Bible, highlight this, because this is a foundational verse, verse 13 and verse 14. Because this is the key to who you are. Now, the world is going to tell you, you need to buy this book, you need to see this therapist, you need to do this, this, and this, so that you can then discover who you are. And this is what I say. You need to open up to about the middle of the Bible, turn to the 139th Psalm, Read verse 13 and read verse 14 because that is the foundation of who you are. Verse 13, he knit me together in my mother's womb. And then verse 14, I will praise you, David says, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, what does that mean to be fearfully and wonderfully made? If you were to go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, and you were to see when God was just speaking things into existence. And we get towards the end of creation. And this is what's recorded in the very, very beginning of the scripture. So God created man in his own image. Do, 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 you, do you catch that? We read it. We may have memorized it. If you've been a part of the church for very long, you've heard Sunday school lesson taught on it. You've gone to children's church and they have taught on it. You've sat under sermons. You've heard this over and over and over and over. And we read over it and we forget the power in those few words. For God created mankind in his own image. Now at this point, God was just creating man. We hadn't got to the, to the woman just yet. But he created man in his own image. That is important information for you to understand the wonderfulness and the fearfulness in which God created you when he knit you together in your mother's womb. Because God didn't just create Adam and Eve in his own image, but that was passed down to each of us that we are created in the image of God. And that's why we have to know who God is so we can know who ourself is. Because we were created in the image of God. It goes on to say, in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created him. Each and every one of us are created in the image of God. Well, then what's the image of God? We see in the image of God, there are three parts to God. If we were to say it's the Trinity, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's three parts. So what did God do when he created us? He gave mankind three parts. Interesting, isn't that? We don't think about that a whole lot. There are three parts to us. There's the mind, body, and the spirit, or the soul. In the image of God, the three parts of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God gave us three parts, the mind, the body, and the soul. Now, in the church, we talk a whole lot about the soul, and we leave out the body. We don't talk a whole lot about the mind. Where I believe the enemy is, is attacking our world the most is in the mind. I think the world is tired of hearing about the soul. I think we have over-churched our culture when we should have been Jesusizing our culture, if, 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 you, if you catch what it is that I'm saying there. We've told the world, you got to be in the church, you got to be a part of the church, you got to be a part of the church, you got to be a part of the church, when the truth of the matter is, you got to be a part of Jesus. Because you can be in the church all day long and still not have Jesus. But when you have Jesus, you're a part of the church. That's another sermon for another day. But when we focus on the wrong things and we don't know who God is, then we proclaim the wrong message that the world gets tired of. And so I believe that we have proclaimed the wrong message on the importance of being a part of the church and, and, and left off a lot of what the message should have been of why you've got to be a part of Jesus and accepting Jesus as your Savior, and then you automatically become a part of the church. It doesn't matter who votes you in or who votes... I'll get back. I, I have to get away from that. Um, that's a pet peeve of mine. Um, and, and why, when you give your life to Christ, you are already a part of the church. That's why we don't have church membership, because we can't put you in and we can't put you out. And you see, when we are focusing on the wrong thing, the church instead of Jesus, we have missed the way that God set things into order in his kingdom. And so in God creating a man in his own image, there's three parts to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity that we're taught of in the Scripture. When it's proclaimed in Genesis that God created man in his image, it's so interesting that God created man with three parts, the mind, the body, and the soul. And we forget in the church a lot of time about the body, and we forget about the mind. And so, again, I think that Satan is attacking the mind in so many different ways so that we forget that we have to have a proper understanding of God in using the intellect that God has given to us to understand Him so that we make sure that our body and our soul is in proper alignment with being created in His image. David said in verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In Genesis 1.27, we see the fearfulness, or another translation of this, is the reverence that God is doing the creating in. When God created you in your mother's womb, there was a holy reverence because God's hand was at work creating you. We don't think about that. We just think, well, I'm a product of this, or I'm a product of that. I'm a, this is how I got to be here. No, you got to be here because God desired for you to be here. It was God at work bringing you into this world. And so then once we get here, the enemy starts proclaiming these lies over us over and over and over that comes out of a bad understanding or an absence, if you will, a relationship with God. And so we then start to take on these and we think, well, I am this way because of this. I am this because of that. And when you are applying that math to your life, you have the wrong product. You are a product of God. God created you, and God desires to have relationship with you. You are fearfully, reverently, and wonderfully made by the creator of the universe. And so when the enemy's lies come into our life, We've got to stand against them through the power that Jesus gave us on the cross and shedding his blood and say, enemy, I don't believe that lie because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And so when the enemy says, oh, you're ugly, when the enemy says, oh, you're, you're too dumb, you're not smart enough, or the enemy says, you're too short, or you're too this, or you're too that, 
You have to say, no, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't enter into a conversation with the enemy. Go right back to Scripture and proclaim the eternal word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword in saying, he knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you want to understand God... You go directly to the Scriptures. And God has revealed Himself through the Scripture. And so in God revealing the work that He has done, we have to adapt that as our own. And so when the enemy says, Oh, you're too blonde. You should have been a brunette. Or you're too brunette. You should have been a blonde. You're too wide and you should have been a... Stop having that conversation with the enemy. And say, He knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That is the answer for who you are. And until you have that as your foundation, you will always live in a world of chaos that the enemy is reigning and controlling areas of your life. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, isn't it interesting? I've, I found this interesting, and I'll give you a little insight into how my brain works. I just think it's so interesting that David wrote these words that came out of a relationship with God. And we're seeing into, in, in David's journal here in the 139th Psalm, and we are reading this, this, uh, this hymn that he has written in his journal that then was produced into a song that we have insight into the work of God. And it's so interesting, amazing to me, that David chose these words that the Holy Spirit laid on his heart for us to be a part of, and there weren't even any x-rays around. Couldn't take a picture inside your body. David didn't see inside the body to see all of this stuff that was there. They didn't know all about the, the, the uh, skeletal structure. They didn't know about the nervous system. They didn't know about the cardiovascular They didn't know any of that stuff. They could not see all of that stuff. There was no modern medicine. The modern medicine was if your arm hurts, we'll cut it off, and hopefully that it's going to stop hurting. That's how, they, that's how they did things then. But now we have this amazing insight into the true wonderfulness of who you are. This is a little bit about who God knit together inside your mother's womb. You have 206 bones. There are 650 muscles inside your body. You have 590 miles of hair. Some have a little more, some have a little less. My wife has 5,000 miles of hair, and it's all in the bottom of the drain of the shower. <laughs> we produce a wig a week at our house. Uh, anyway, I'll pay for that later. <laughs> um, you have in your body 10 vital organs. You have 20 square feet of skin. You have 60 trillion cells in your body. You have 7 octillion atoms in your body. That's 7 with 27 zeros after it. You have approximately 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. 60,000 miles. Now to give you a perspective... To give you a perspective, around the earth, the circumference of the earth is only 25, approximately 25,000 miles. If we took all of your blood vessels, all of your veins, and laid them out one by one by one, end to end to end, it would be enough to more than go around the world twice. You, you see how wonderfully made you are? Do you see the awesomeness of what God did in your body to bring you into this world, you have approximately 100,000 miles of nerves in your body. The human brain, it only weighs approximately three pounds, but it can store one quadrillion bits of information. That's more than the biggest computer that's ever been created. Your heart beats around three billion times in the average person's lifetime. Three billion times. Your heart pumps approximately, depending on your, acti um, your activity, about seven gallons of blood per minute in your body. That's about 2,000 gallons of blood a day. And in an average lifetime, your heart alone, that one muscle in your body, will pump about 1.5 million barrels of blood. That's enough to fill 200 
railroad tanker cars. Your lungs, they inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale without us even thinking about it much, about 25,000 times a day. So for those of you that are about 70 years old, you've already taken about 9 million breaths without giving it a whole lot of thought. Do you see the wonderfulness of your body? I, I, I said all of that just to see the intricate detail that God put into just you. And we can say, oh, well, that person is a little different from us, or that person looks a little, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They were still fearfully and wonderfully made by God Almighty. And God designed you, and he had you in mind in that design. And so what we have to do is understand God so we can understand who we are, so that we are able to relate to the world rather than shun the rest of the world. My point for you today, if you get nothing else, is you were designed by God, fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, God was speaking to Jeremiah, and in speaking to Jeremiah, Jeremiah records it in chapter 1 of his writings, verse 4 and 5. He said, then the word of the Lord came to me. This is God speaking directly to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before God fearfully and wonderfully made you, he knew you. He knew that you were going to be here. You see, it's just another proving point that you are not a product of your parents. You were designed by God and are here for a purpose and here for a, for a reason. And so we have to work to understand God so that we can understand ourselves, so that we can relate and understand other people. And a great way to do that is through the Enneagram. And so I want to encourage you to take a look at that when we send it out this week. Uh, we'll send it out later today on Facebook. We'll send it out by email tomorrow. Um, just take a look at that. It's been great for me to see a little bit of the wiring that I have to understand. As, I, as I've, I've read uh, two books on it now, uh, it's been interesting. And then I've started to say, oh, there's, you know, see some of this in other people. And when we don't understand ourselves, we can't understand other people. And so we can't understand what makes those people tick. So here's the deal. We're all different. We understand that. We are all different. But what we try to do is make everybody fit into our little box and say, if people aren't just like me, well, then they must be wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong thinking. We have to understand how we work so that we can understand how other people work so that we can join together and walk through life encouraging one another instead of beating everybody up. We have to understand God so that we can understand ourselves, so that we can relate and understand other people so that God gets all the glory when we recognize that every one of us, every one of us, were knit together in our mother's womb by God. And each of us were fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me leave you with this scripture. Romans 7, 15. I really have wrestled with this scripture throughout my entire life. Um, it's an interesting scripture. Paul says something that uh, maybe should make the hair on the back of our head stand up. Because he said, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And this is is something that every single one of us feel at time in our relationship with God and our relationship with ourselves. What we want to do, I just don't do it. And what I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing. The reason that we get like this sometimes is because we don't understand who God is and we can't understand who we are so that we can properly overcome this desire that is at work inside each one of us, causing us to do what we don't want to do so that we can then eventually get to the point to where we have overcome that and taken on the blood of Christ to compel us to become more and more like Him. 
So if you've ever lived this verse, if you've ever thought this verse, if you have ever thought, man, why is it that I do that? Then you're in the right place. And we're going to peel back some layers of the onions over the next three weeks. And I hope that you will have a better understanding of why it is that you do the things you don't want to do and you don't do the things that you want to do. And that comes from a proper understanding of God so we can have a right understanding of ourselves so that we can then relate to other people and together walk more and uh, together walk hand in hand to become more the way that God created us to be fearfully and wonderfully made. We're going to close this morning. I asked Pastor Jason to close with this song. It says, I am who you say I am. We can't be, we can't be what the enemy wants us to be or who the enemy desires for us to be any longer. We have to have a commitment that this song is going to be our driving force to be who God says we are instead of the lies that the enemy tries to put into our life. And so as we stand and as we sing in a minute, I want to ask you to make a couple of commitments at the end of our service. The first is I want to ask you to let this song be your uh, motivation for leaving here today, to be a, a compelling force for you, to be who God says that you are and nothing else, to be who God created you to be. And the second thing, as I've said this and I can't say it enough, is I want to encourage you to pick up a journal and I want to encourage you to be in a community group. Because there I believe in going through this journal with other people is you will have a better understanding of who God is so that you have a better understanding of who, you're, who you are so that you can better relate to other people and together we walk to become more and more like Christ.